Okay, thank you very much, Florian Gormogert, and good evening to you all. Uh, I hope you're all very well and feeling a bit energised as we begin to address probably the most substantial topic you are all sure. facing into as professionals, workers, citizens, members of the public, people perhaps who have had some experience of housing stress in their lives, who are in housing stress, who are observing the uh, outcome uh, across all spheres of life uh, in our city, particularly today with the ongoing impacts uh, in the city around new populations, new identities, new citizens, new communities. Uh, it's a busy place, housing. There's lots going on. Uh, and it can be very noisy. So one of our kind of golden rules here is that we're going to have a debate and a discussion today. Uh, the first rule is one of respect and tolerance for everybody in the room. I think we've all agreed with that. So please, no exclamatory language that will otherwise need a heavy edit. <laughs> Uh, but there's no point in holding back either, so, you know, let, let it out if it's in you, but please, in a polite and respectful way. Uh, the second thing really is that uh, all phasers on stun, as they like to say in Star Trek, so please remember to put that phone on silent. Um, I'll give everybody a minute now to do that, of course, but there's a certain generation here that takes an age to figure out how to do that. That's me, giving a new phone a year later going, oh, that's how you switch it off, quickly. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, and then the third thing really is that as we go through this, take a note of what you want to ask, what you want to comment on. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Now, I can't guarantee the reply will meet the standard of the question, but I think today you're probably going to hear a standard of replies and engagement much higher than otherwise. Uh, this is not uh, anything other than a, a very informed knowledge hub exchanging ideas and information. So, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. Let me see if I can get this to move on. This is uh, Dr. Michelle Norris. Michelle is perhaps well known to some of you here who are working in the area of housing, uh, who may be uh, attending some of her lectures or indeed reading her published work. Michelle is the director of the Geary Institute for Public Policy at University College Dublin, a professor of social policy, social work and social justice. Uh, her teaching and research interests focus on housing policy and urban regeneration, particularly the provision management, financing of social housing in the Europe and also the regeneration of social housing estates and inner urban areas. Michelle is a very well-published academic with over 200 publications, 30 research projects. Uh, most recently, uh, in recognition of her outstanding work, really, in the policy world, uh, she's been awarded the Irish Research Council's Research Impact Award in 2021. She has a long-standing link with a number of policymakers, uh, chair of a number of uh, state agencies, including the Housing Finance Agency. Uh, so I think you agree with me that she's fully qualified to help address the topic tonight. So without further ado, thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Di. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm a bit nervous about having to bring up the start things off. And I'm, 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 I have two architects following me, so they're bound to have much more interesting and impressive slides and much more interesting and engaging talk. Um, so I think I was brought here to kind of vary the, the panel a bit in terms of housing histories. And I wanted to talk about how we paid for social housing in the past. And in particular, people are always asking me, how did we pay for all the council housing we built in the 20s, 30s and 40s and 50s when the country was broke? How did we manage to um, fund all that? social housing when the economy was on its knees in the 1950s. So uh, I thought that might be interesting to, to look at how we did it in the past and what lessons we can learn from how we did it in the past. Um, so I've called my talk Financing the Golden Age of, of Social Housing and, um, and the Dark Age of Which Followed. Um, so I've mentioned um, the period between the 1930s and the 1950s is often um, viewed as a golden age for social housing in Ireland, but also in the rest of Western Europe in particular. There was a huge, huge expansion of um, social housing. And in Ireland, at the time, nearly all built by council, so it was, it was council housing. Um, so local authority housing made up um, over half um, the, all the housing built in Ireland in the 1930s and 65% of housing built in the 1940s. So you can see the social housing is in white at the bottom and the private housing output is in yellow at the top. 
there was very little housing built in the 1920s after the, um, the War of Independence for, for that period. And in particular, there was a legacy of very, very serious slums in large parts of Dublin inner city, but also large parts of Cork and Limerick inner city. And concerted action to start clearing the slums started in 1932, um, spurred by the 1932 Housing Act, which was the first major piece of legislation brought in by the first Fianna Fáil government elected in 1932. Um, so from then until the 1950s, um, social housing um, made up more than half of all houses built. So you can see at the grey the gray line at the, at the top of the graph um, is uh, the proportion or the percentage of all households who live in social housing. Um, so the, the building scheme, the output at the time, was so high that by 1961, 18.4% of households in Ireland lived in social housing, lived in council housing, effectively. Um, so the sector was extremely large. Um, and what's interesting about the period is we managed to fund this very large amount of building um, and very lar large amount of spending on social housing, even though the rest of our welfare state didn't expand at the same time. So this period, particularly after World War II, was a period when social services and also social security benefits, dole, pensions, um, incapacity benefit, all of that radically expanded in the rest of Western Europe. They didn't expand in Ireland. We were much slower in terms of expanding you know, what would be normal, a normal, usual, standard Western European welfare state, but we spent a lot of money on housing at the time, and also a lot of money on redistribution of land, the breakup of the, the large landed estates from pre-independence and redistributing them to tenant farmers. So housing and property redistribution kind of acted as our welfare state in some ways at the time. Um, so you can see from the graph that the proportion of households living in social housing rose. We only have data from the, the late 40s, but rose all the way to the 60s and then started to decline um, very rapidly, decade after decade after decade. And it got to a low of 7.1% in um, 2001. So that reflects a couple of factors, but one of the factors it reflects is private housing output started to rise. You can see the huge amount of private housing output in the yellow bar we had in the 2000s, but that's kind of a long-term trend you can see starting in the 1970s. Private housing output started to rise. The amount of social housing we built as a proportion of total started to fall. And then from the 1980s, in absolute terms, in other words, the number of dwellings we built every year in the social housing sector started to fall. So the output of the sector got smaller and smaller, and the proportion of the population living in the sector got smaller. So in some ways, we had a golden age of huge expansion in this sector at a time when, on paper, we had very little money to pay for it. And then that was followed by more of a dark age when the sector started to shrink and the proportion of households living in the sector started to shrink. So one of the, what I wanted to talk about today, excuse me, is how did Ireland achieve such high rates of social housing output when the economy was depressed and when living standards were far lower than today? How did we manage to build, this is Thorncastle Street in Ring's End, which was built in 1936. Um, how did we manage to build um, estates like that in that context? Um, uh, you know, in that um, uh, context of, of relatively little money in the country. So obviously, you know, I'm a social scientist, so I always say it's complicated, don't I? That's why you need academics to write books. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, these achievements reflect lots of things. So they reflect big macro-level societal factors like ideology, what the government thought was worth spending money on, distribution of power, who they thought was worth spending money on, the general economy, etc. But it also reflects how social housing was paid for. And how you pay for social housing, how you finance its provision, is always a big challenge, because housing is what economists call a lumpy good. So what they mean by that is, if you're funding a pension scheme, for instance, I pay a bit of your pension, 
this week and your pension next week and somebody else's pension, two pensions the following week. And I incrementally spend a bit of money all the way along and a lot of people get pensions and the pension scheme, um, the pension scheme uh, expands. The same with health. It's funded by ongoing spending a bit all the time. Whereas with housing, you have to fund the purchase or construction of it up front before you consume it. So you've got to pay up front. So how you deal with that is always a challenge. Homeowners generally deal with it by getting a mortgage. So you, you get the money from the bank and then you distribute the payments over your lifetime. But social housing providers have to deal with the same issue. So the financing of the sector, how you pay for it, actually has an enormous influence on how big the sector is and how small the sector is, irrespective in some ways of how much state money goes in. Um, so today I want to look at how um, the golden age of social housing was financed um, and the financing and housing uh, policy factors which precipitated its demise. So why did the output in, in relative terms start to fall from the 1960s and in absolute terms start to fall so much from the 1980s? And why did the proportion of people living in social housing fall to levels which I think there's a general consensus were far too low for the needs in society and the needs of our labour market. Um, so, I'm just going to start from the start. So, the social housing sector in Ireland emerged in the 1880s. So, that was quite early in European terms. We were part of the United Kingdom at the time. So, a similar model for financing social housing in Ireland and Britain emerged. And this model is actually similar to the approach used in most of Western Europe. Um, so from that period, the, the kind of three pillars were set up to, to finance the social, social housing provision. So the first one was borrowing by local government who provided most social housing. So they borrowed historically from three main sources. First, there was municipal bond issues. So Dublin City Council would issue municipal bonds, and in other words, loans, and they did that all the way up to 1956, was the last one they issued for uh, housing. And these are commonly issued by municipalities across the world. They also borrowed from commercial banks. So Dublin and Cork city councils tended to issue bonds. The smaller local authorities, county councils, and we had town councils at the time as well, they would have borrowed from the local bank. And there was also a central government borrowing facility. Central government would borrow and lend on to local authorities, and that was called the Local Loans Fund. It didn't initially fund housing, but it was extended to fund housing. So just like a, a household, they took a big loan from, from various sources. So how do they pay it back? So there was a couple of different sources. The first was central government subsidies. So one of the subsidies was a grant, and that was kind of a deposit on the loan. You know, they'd get a grant of a proportion of the costs. And the second type of subsidy was a subsidy on the interest rate. So unlike what we've experienced in the last two decades, interest rates fluctuated a lot in the past. So that created a lot of problems in terms of financing social housing. Because obviously tenants didn't have the facility to up and decrease and, and um, increase their, their rents. So interest rate subsidies were provided generally by governments to ensure the interest rate remained stable. And then the third part... Um, is that local government revenue funding played a major part in funding social housing provision. So again, there were three sources of local government revenue funding, or sorry, two sources of local government revenue funding. The first was rates, in other words, local property taxes, we call them now. But unlike now, there were rates on agricultural land, uh, there were rates on businesses, which we still have, and there were rates on domestic dwellings. Okay, so the rates on businesses remained, um, the rates on agricultural land and domestic dwellings didn't. Um, but rates income, property tax income, was a major part of how they repaid the loans. And then the final bit is tenants' rents. So in every social housing system, tenants' rents repay the loans. Generally, they're the main source of money to repay the loans. And in the past, in Ireland, this was the case. So originally, rents on social housing in Ireland were set as... In Ireland, we call them economic rents. In other words, they had to cover the full cost of paying back the loan, managing and maintaining the dwelling. But in the rest of Europe, this model is called cost rents, rents set at cost. And those of you who are following housing policy at the moment may have noticed that the government have reintroduced this model, 
called cost rental, where the rents are set at cost, and they repay the loan and cover management and maintenance. So we've kind of gone in a complete loop. But anyway, here we call them economic rents, and um, uh, rather than uh, cost rents, and they reflected the, the uh, costs of debt service management and maintenance of dwellings. So that was the broad model used to fund the sector. The model broadly remained the same from the time it was introduced in the 1880s right up to the 1980s. But the details of the model changed over the period, and that is kind of an important part of the story. So as I mentioned, social housing output after independence started to increase after the 1932 Housing Act. But obviously, we'd been independent for 10 years before then. So what happened before the Golden Age? Um, so before the Golden Age, in the 1920s, there was very, very, very low social housing output. In fact, it was way lower than before independence. Okay, so output fell after independence for the, for the first 10 years. So, so why was this? And the main reason was they, they, they messed around with the funding model. So Cumann and Nail, who were the, the first... Um, uh, government of, of the independent state, um, removed the subsidies for social housing provision that had been there for, under British rule. And the 1924 Housing Act removed the subsidies for interest loan repayments. And it replaced them with grants, but the grants were set at the same level as the grants available to home buyers to purchase a house. So... If you were an ordinary home buyer, you got the same grant as the council for social housing. So the grant level was just way, way too low. The other issue is there were very severe difficulties in borrowing after independence. The banking system was very unstable. The banks weren't exactly thrilled that they now found themselves in a new context dealing with the new government. The country had a lot of trouble funding itself. And local authorities, in particular small local authorities, had a lot of trouble raising debt. So... Dublin and Cork City Council issued bonds. They had trouble raising debt. But the real trouble was in county councils, in particular town councils, and the banks simply would not lend to them. So there was huge trouble in actually getting the house building. So this picture here is a picture of Marino, which was Dublin, one of Dublin City Council's first big housing schemes, um, built in 1923, 1923, 24. Am I right? So, interesting thing about Marino, you can see it's an overhead shot of a, you know, still a, a, a lovely place to live, garden city design around these kind of spokes of a wheel and these central green areas. Uh, but some, a part of the story people forget about Marino is none of it remained as social housing, even though it was built by the local authority. It was sold, it was sold under the tenant purchase scheme to people who applied to get a house and buy it, and they paid off the council in instalments, because there weren't mortgages widely available at the time. They paid them off in instalments called annuity payments. So it was never let as social housing, primarily because the council couldn't afford to keep it, or that, that was their view at the time, even though they built it. So how did we get out of that then? What happened? What changed that suddenly output started to rise significantly from 1932? So two things changed. Um, and they're both illustrated in these two graphs. Um, so the first is that um, rural local authorities, county councils and town councils were given access to this central government borrowing facility, the local loans fund, to allow them to borrow for housing. Um, so that kind of got around their issue about access to credit. Dublin and Cork city councils weren't allowed in and they continued to, to depend on bond raising until the 1950s. Um, initially, the take-up was very low. This was actually done before the 1932 Housing Act. Um, but after the first Fianna Fáil government got elected, de Valera got elected, he reintroduced interest subsidies, so councils could afford to take on the loans, and take above the borrowing started to rise very radically. And the other thing he did was to radically increase central government grants, so they got a grant for more of the cost and they had to borrow less and the financing of it wasn't such a struggle. So essentially, those three changes, the local loans fund, the interest rate subsidies and the grants sorted the situation and enabled the slum clearance that took place in the 30s, 40s and 50s. So that was kind of the golden age of social housing in terms of funding. 
what happened that moved us into this age where the output fell in relative terms and then absolute terms? So a, a couple of things happened. The first relates to the rent model we had, economic rents or cost rents. So they were constantly contentious and the subject of debate in the Irish system because Irish politicians were very concerned about housing. The, lower, the, the poorest, we had very little industry in Ireland. In cities, a lot of people were dependent on daily rate work in the docks and things like that. They didn't have a stable income. Councils were trying to house them and they couldn't pay economic rents. So this was a constant... Um, struggle in terms of Dublin City Council in particular delivering its housing programme. How could they build the houses? How could they clear the slums? Because they had to pay the slum landlords for the dwellings to clear the slums, prepare the sites, build flats in particular are more expensive to build in a house than houses. There was a big debate about should we just build suburban houses rather than flats in the inner city? And a lot of it was actually driven by this issue of how do we pay? Um, so that was a constant tension. Now, in the 1930s, this man, Philip Monaghan, who was the Cork city manager and a really enormously influential person in local government circles, he essentially, personally, kind of designed the modern local government system and particularly the city management system we have, the city county manager role. So Philip Monaghan came up with the idea of not linking rents to cost, but linking them to incomes. And at the time, the council housing sector was quite large. So there were people in good jobs and trades and skilled people, and there were people in worth, more badly paid jobs. And Philip Monaghan thought the wealthier ones can pay higher rents, the poorer ones can pay lower rents, and one can subsidise the other. So that was introduced into Cork in 19, the 1930s in income-related rents. Everyone in local government here calls them differential rents. So it was introduced initially in Cork, but gradually the system spread countrywide over the course of the 30s, 40s and 50s. And it was pushed by tenants' campaigns and in particular rent strikes. In other words, refusal to pay rent. And many of those in the later years were organised by an organisation called NATO, or the real NATO, as I like to call them, the National Association of Tenants Organisations, which, to my knowledge, is still in existence. Um, but anyway, NATO organised these rent strikes, and finally, um, the 1966 Housing Act brought in these income-related rents countrywide. But crucially, even though there were very laudable intentions in terms of affordability, it undermined local authorities' ability to service debt. It became much more difficult to service debt because tenants often had low incomes, unpredictable incomes, and they didn't have a stream of income that would allow them to pay the loans. Now, the second big reform that undermined this golden age was the introduction of what they call in Britain the right to buy council housing. So many of you may have, mentioned, have um, uh, come across that Margaret Thatcher introduced this in Britain in 1981. But the equivalent policy in Ireland was introduced in 1936. So in 1936, rural social housing tenants um, who lived in what were called labourers' cottages, including my grandparents, were given the right to buy their council house at two-thirds of the previous rent in instalments, in annuities, and then it was cut to 50% of the previous rent. Now, the reason why that was introduced was that the rural social housing program was strongly linked to land reform. The land was redistributed from big landlords to tenant farmers, and there were still a lot of farm labourers left in a lot of the country who had nowhere to live if the landlord had gone. Um, so they were given rural social housing. And de Valera agreed to cut the repayments tenant farmers paid on their loans to the British government, the land annuities, in the 1932 election, and the rural tenant farmers said, what are you going to do for us? Or the rural farm labourers said, what are you going to do for us? And he was very keen to kind of put together a coalition of rural labourers and urban working class to get himself elected. So this policy chimed well with that. So that policy was introduced in rural areas in 1936. It was extended to towns in 1966, off the back of lots of campaigning, um, but not as much as you'd imagine. Some of it by NATO, it was strongly supported by the Labour Party on the grounds of equity between rural and urban tenants. So uh, this graph looks at the output of council housing, the bars on the top, the yellow, what was built, and the sales of council housing. 
Now, I don't actually have data for pre the 1950s by year, so I've just put them in one bar. But actually, that was spread right back to 1936. Okay, so you can see during that period, in, you know, the new output of council housing was almost counterbalanced by sales. So the devil is in the detail of the sales scheme in terms of how it achieved this outcome. So the first thing to understand is for the 1936 Act and the 1966 Act in, rural, in urban areas introduced a legal obligation to sell. The councils had to sell the house. They previously had the power to do so if they wanted, but they rarely did, but they were obliged to do so. Um, the second issue is they were forced to sell at below economic rent initially, and pre then afterwards it, the policy was changed and they were forced to sell at below market value when people got mortgages and, and bought it. So that meant the sales price wasn't always high enough to repay the housing development loan they got from the local loans fund or the bonds or the, the bank, and it was very unlikely to be enough to replace the dwelling. So the system started to shrink. So it's kind of hard to follow the graph, so I, I thought I'd just uh, give you some statistics. So this picture is Green Street Ballybricken in Waterford City. Don't know if anyone from Waterford. And it is the first council housing estate built in Ireland in the 1880s. And it was built actually before there was any public subsidy. Waterford Corporation, as it was then, went out and raised a bond on the stock market and paid to build it. So since Green Street, Local authorities in Ireland, I've calculated, have provided 365,000 th 365, dwellings. But who's counting? So if we translate that into the national housing stock currently, that's 22% of the national housing stock. But councils now house 8.7% of households and just 30% of renters. So the difference between the 22% of the stock they built and the 8.7% of the stock they own reflects the level of privatisation. Um, currently, under the sales scheme, dwellings are sold at 40 to 60% below market value. And if we didn't have this level of privatisation, we would have the same amount of social housing as, for instance, Vienna. You know, everyone's very keen on the Vienna model. Or uh, Denmark, place, France, places with a lot of social housing. So then the final reform which precipitated the um, decline of the golden age of social housing. So this is a very blurry picture of Jack Lynch campaigning in the 1977 um, general election, so apologies, it was the only one I could find. Um, so the third factor was the decline in income from rates. So as rents started to fall, local authorities became more and more dependent on income from rates to pay down development loans for social housing. But the income from rates fell almost continuously throughout the 20th century. So farmers, this will come as no surprise to anyone here, were not very keen on paying agricultural rates, rates on agricultural land. And they campaigned constantly against this throughout the 20th century. And there were a series, in fact, of farmers' parties that were set up to campaign against the payment of agricultural rates. So the, the level of agricultural rates was cut and cut and cut. Urban dwellers were not that keen on paying domestic rates, urban property taxes either. And across the country, there were organisations called ratepayers associations that would campaign against having to pay such high rates. Um, and as a result of this, there were consistent cuts in the level of domestic rates, but the bigger issue was there was a pile of exemptions introduced. So there was exemptions for newlyweds, there was exemptions for people who'd done up their house, there was exemptions for people who'd bought a house four years ago, this kind of thing. So there were so many holes in the system. The... Um, the money went downhill, but also there were big anomalies between counties. So you could be in Leitrim and paying twice as much as your neighbour in Roscommon, which made it very unpopular. So lynches were remembered for abolishing, campaigning on the abolition of rates in 1977. What's not remembered, and it's worth pointing out, is all other parties also campaigned on either the abolition of rates or cuts in rates. So everybody did. So rates were finally abolished in 1978. So it meant that rents had gone downhill. Often the houses had been sold, it wasn't enough to repay the development loan. And the final source of money to repay the loans, which was uh, rates, 
also disappeared. So essentially, there was no money to keep on paying this loan system. And central government from 1978 took over fun funding it. So the abolition of domestic rates is kind of forgotten about now, unless you worked in local authorities at the time. It triggered a huge financial crisis in local government. And there were compulsory redundancies in the local government sector in the early 1980s to deal with this. And it triggered a huge crisis in how to pay for social housing. So finally, in, sorry, that should be 1986, um, in 1986, 1987, the Charlie Hawhey, Ray McSharry was Minister for Finance Governments, introduced a series of cuts, including the abolition of this loan system for paying for social housing, because their attitude was the government give the loans and then the government repay the loans. So Ray McSharry in his speech said this is kind of a circular model and there's no reason for having it. Um, so that model was abolished in 1987 and it was replaced with central government grants, that's how we fund council housing provision now, topped up by the proceeds of sales to tenants, so we're selling dwellings at a loss to fund new replacement dwellings. Um, and in recent years, local property tax has also contributed to funding council housing provision, but only a small bit. Um, so this financing, new financing model we have is also problematic. So I mentioned at the start, housing finance is lumpy. You have to produce all your money at the start in a big lump, even though you consume the housing over the long term. But this model with grants means that all the costs are concentrated at the start. Central government has to meet them out of their general budget. It can be hard to afford. And it's also very, always very, very tempting to cut back capital spending as a an alternative to, for instance, cutting my wages, or cutting social welfare, or cutting spending on health service, running the health service, etc. So the model has um, brought us a kind of a boom-bust model of funding. We've had periods where spending collapsed in the late 80s after the introduction of the model, it increased in the 90s, then it collapsed after the financial crisis, and it increased again. So it's a really inefficient way of funding social housing. The people in the system know it means they have to ramp down their program, then buy land and get, take on architects and ramp up the program, which is always extremely challenging. So I mentioned at the start, the government have now, after how many years, gone back and essentially reintroduced the original model we had for financing social housing in the form of cost rental, but it's targeted at people with kind of slightly higher incomes than the social housing limit. This is a model that's used in countries like Austria, Denmark, with very well-run, well-managed, well-maintained social housing sectors. So my final question, should we go back to the future, or should we go back to the future and re-examine the, uh, the reintroduction of the initial funding model we had that funded the golden age of social housing? in the middle of the 20th century. So that's it. Thanks. Michelle, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. A veritable tour de force. So if you ever asked the question, whatever happened to my council housing, <laughs> follow the money was the answer. Really, quite yeah. simply, follow the money. Look at what has happened in the way that the political economy of housing and its production its exchange, its consumption, has changed over the period. We haven't mentioned the details of that, but they'll come forward in our discussion, I'm sure. As an aside, because I couldn't resist it, just for the wonks in the room, that's no backwards in case anybody thinks I'm being rude. I believe it was Anthony Crossland who wrote a paper for the Fabian Society, British Labour Party, in 1977, proposing the introduction of the right to buy in British council housing so that capital receipts could be reinvested in the production of new housing. Thatcher heard that and thought it was a bloody great idea, except that her capital receipts were used to cut uh, the public sector expenditure costs and to actually lower taxation. Correct. So, there you go. Yeah, but the Labour Party passed the legislation that the facilitated it. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. correct. So it's always interesting to see how bipartisan housing becomes when you're following the money because it's not a case of left versus right necessarily. It's the distribution. Who's benefiting? Cubono, bono? Who benefits? Okay. I'll leave that with you, please. Come back on that. That's certainly a, a lot to talk about afterwards.
and especially as you ended with cost rental, back to the future. So who's going to be the doc doc? But anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute because we do have in Dublin a planning permission sought and uh, under, under consideration by Ambor Planola for the uh, cost rental scheme that we're proposing at Emmet Road. And I know there's one or two people in the audience here who have a few views on that too. Okay. So we'll move forward, if you don't mind, yeah. considering time is against us. Time waits for no one. <laughs> time flies like an arrow. Can't resist this one. Spike Milligan said, fruit flies prefer bananas. Now, Brian Ward. If, no, uh, oh, sorry, it's oh, Ellen. Me. Sorry, Ellen's our next speaker. So Ellen will be known to you, I hope. Um, Ellen is an architectural and cult cult cultural historian. <laughs> Nearly tripped over that one. I'm sorry about that. Um, who's done a lot of work uh, in particular, art and architecture being one of her ma major considerations. But Ellen's going to talk to us about, as you can see here, clearing hovels and building homes, solutions in the 1940s and 1950s. Mm -hmm. And we're going to bring it right up to date, I think you were saying. You want to bring it... No, I'll finish in the 50s. You're going to finish in the Brian 50s. Brian is going to bring Brian's it up to date. Right up. Well, to the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> so this get, brings us up to date, the exhibition. This, this, the exhibition yeah. brings us up to date. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Helen's done quite a lot of work. You, you probably, if you were, if you're radio fans, you may have heard Helen's uh, radio uh, work uh, on the RT documentary series and the Thomas Davis lectures, which were great, Making Home, that went out in 2019, 2020. Um, yeah. Folks, there are some seats over here if you want to. Yeah, there's seats. Yourself, so come along. Oh, come do you want to come in? Come in, join the crowd. Um, Di, will you jock. tell me when I've reached 15 minutes I'll and then I'll fly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've overstuffed the turkey, um, so I've too I'm much well. material. Thanks, Di. Um, yeah, I've, I've too much material, so I'm going to probably fly through uh, the second examples. Um, what I wanted to do, the, the name of this talk, Clearing Hovels and Building Homes, I've used it a couple of times. It's based on a lecture that was given in June 1941. Um, by a vanguard, a young vanguard architect, Noel Moffat. Um, and in that lecture, it's a really interesting moment in Irish architectural history, Irish architectural or housing um, history, whereby this young architect is staking a claim for modernist or critical architecture within the territory of housing what was termed um, the country's poor, uh, what was called public housing at that point, also housing the masses and housing for the working class. So this moment about 80 years ago or so um, in Irish architectural history really reminds me of what's happening today in the, with the crisis, but specifically making a think tank for critical, um, well, for, for, kind of, for critical design and for bringing innovation back in to the territory of the crisis. Um, and so in the 1940s, it's the height of housing reform um, and it's housing reform that doesn't seem to be working. So there's resonances completely with what's happening today. As Michelle so lyrically and beautifully put it, and actually her lecture is the highlight um, of the Davis Now series, so they're available by podcast. Um, was it lecture number three you did? Or lecture, yeah. Um, on the economics, she just sorts it all out for me because I don't really understand the money. Um, but as she described and explained, um, much of what we've inherited today originated in this 1931 and 32 set of legislation, set of acts, which tried to tackle slum clearance with this two-pronged solution of uh, you know, building flats, inner city flats behind you, the scheme at Townsend Street is there in the dark, um, like never before seen, and then accelerating um, garden suburb cottage, as they were known, cottage style um, housing out in the suburbs, in the fringe, in the virgin territories of the suburbs. So both the flat and the cottage of the 1930s become the standard typology, as we know, in terms of design, layout and geography that wind their way um, in varying forms through Dublin's urban history and thereafter. Um, so many of the resonances with today, apart from like the crisis and uh, the fact that things weren't improving, um, the, the, the reform that had been happening in the late 1930s was uh, rudely interrupted by international crisis, much as what's happening today. 80 years ago, it was World War II. Today, it's a number of things. The Russian invasion on Ukraine exacerbating uh, the already extreme climate crisis fuel shortage, which in World War II was material shortage, which was really acutely felt 
by neutral, non-belligerent Ireland, which was very isolated and peripheral. There was no steel except for the small works in Cork, very little imported timber, no bakelite or plastics for finishing, and so on. And so, of course, to draw another comparator to then and now, um, in terms of seismic events, what happened with COVID-19 for the 1930s and 40s, Ireland was buffeted by the Wall Street crash. So there's these kind of chords of continuity that resonate and vibrate. Um, still, the extent, despite this level of construction that happened in those seven years, over 7,500 dwellings in Dublin, um, of which up just over 1,000 were flats, um, but still, by the end of that decade, the, the, the problem seemed to be just as acute. It was insoluble, as people said. Um, and there was this uh, really important inquiry um, into, into this, into housing, and it revealed that by 1938, there were still over 22,000 families living in unfit um, housing in insanitary conditions. And really interestingly, like what, what M Michelle points out, um, when you follow the money, uh, a four-roomed cottage um, for its superstructure was costing £565. And the same four-roomed flat in the inner city was costing almost twice that at 992. Um, it also shone a light on the bias of development and what was going to happen increasingly through the century, um, whereby in 1938, of the dwellings being designed, almost 7,000 warehouses, suburban houses, and 1,641 were flats. Um, so uh, slums um, were... Uh, uh, a very, a very keen, visceral reality, um, and they were, you know, the the housing around the city was called, as one commentator called it, a foul blot on 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 the social life of the nation. And um, so the city was marred by these spectacles. And um, by the 1940s, the country had been independent for 20 years, so the colonial overlord couldn't be explicitly blamed anymore. So it's this process of decolonization and anglicize de-anglicization. And um, so I wanted to show some and race, as you can hear by the speed. I'm talking, I wanted to race through some alternative solutions to the housing crisis that either haven't endured because of demolition or were so fringe that they've been forgotten or were never known about in the first place. The first example um, is this third solution on the right-hand side of the screen. So you've got Flats, Mary Aikenhead House, um, and then we've got uh, Crumlin uh, cottages being constructed. But what of this third solution, which emerged in the, in the early 1940s, which is called reconditioning. So the reconditioning project, as you can see, these are images from Gardner Street. This is before reconditioning below and after reconditioning um, after. So reconditioning entailed uh, identifying um, a set of uh, uh, houses. I'm, I'm broadly calling them Georgian. We go into the Victorian period, but let's just call it Georgianism. Um, these are, you know, these are houses, they're four, four or five storey over basements, occasionally two storey over basement in some of the smaller ones. And um, they're picked out and uh, the facade is maintained and then um, a whole life is made, a 1940s life is made for these, these facades at the back. What's really interesting, while Abercrombie um, suggested in his plan for Dublin that um, these Georgian terraces be rehabilitated for housing. It was for the white collar um, workers rather than for those who were living in the tenements, who were, were tenement dwellers. Um, so this reconditioning project was about maintaining community to a certain degree in these sites, but um, at a much lower density. Um, so it's a really interesting and I think powerful example today for us of this unexpected reuse and rehabilitation of existing urban fabric during the early years of the emergency or the Second World War. It was hailed a miracle of planning um, and it became the prime agent um, for, the, for the country, or for the local authority, rather, local government in Dublin um, to rehouse and to house people to improve housing during these years um, of the war. Um, so it really becomes the alternative to Sims as blocks. Um, and we can hear, we can read some of this discourse here from um, a government pamphlet which was boasting about the project in 1948. In our own city, Dublin, about Christmas 1942, was started a scheme which, uh, though not spectacular enough to claim the attention of the world at large, 
was still of vital importance to us who are citizens. Let me tell you about it and just jump to the end. Um, mentions how everywhere else the, the war is raging and everything's being reduced to rubble. But here and there in odd corners of the world, things of a constructive nature are still being done um, and so on and so forth. So uh, between um, 1943 and 1948, 352 units in um, Dublin were reconditioned. Um, in terms of uh, the city and questions of urban value and cultural identity through buildings, it's interesting to project that rehabilitating these Georgian Dublin streets um, sits fairly ambiguously in terms of, on the one hand, you have these um, increasingly uh, negative um, attitudes towards the city centre as an appropriate place for housing uh, families and housing the, the working classes. Um, but secondly, reconditioning, as we can see in this kind of quasi-conservationist um, chat as part of the same discourse, um, we're seeing perhaps a shift in attitude on the part of municipal officials whereby the Georgian architecture of the city could be somewhat embraced through rationalisation. For those of you who can't read the quote, um, our, our uh, pamphlet describes turning from O'Connell Street onto Sean McDermott Street, which has been newly opened through Carl Brewer Street, it should be said. So in a way, this, gap, this kind of, this open sore that is the slums um, is available to the world to see from O'Connell Street. Um, so it's into, you walk into Sean McDermott Street and you see this grand array of new housing, which has at once served the threefold purpose of accommodating people who are desperately in need of proper shelter, so it's need, of preserving intact the beauty and character of this historic locality, and then thirdly, of thinning the density of population in the area. Um, it's all about thinning density at this time. It's almost a mirror of what we're talking about today, which is about increasing density and maximizing um, land use and land value. This rationalization process, I'd like to run through what happened in terms of the architectonics. Um, sorry, I'm speaking too fast, and that's for, for my own health. Um, it's overseen by the Corporation's Housing Maintenance Architect, an English architect, a W N Turnan, um, and we have his drawings because Susan Rowntree, formerly of Dublin City Council, um, found them all. She was working on the demolition of of the last of these on, on York Street. So what you're looking at is three key sites here: York Street. Um, behind Stevens Green, Sean McDermott Street and Gardner Street, although they seem to have, um, there, were, there were nodes throughout the north inner city particularly. So the slums, as we know, in Dublin, and Michelle mentioned them, were among the worst in, in, in Europe. Um, we have all these accounts um, just down the road here in the Gilbert Library from the, the medical officer who also acted as the housing inspector, Dr. Russell. And he's constantly reporting to the housing committee at this time, describing families living in one room with no sanitation. Temporary sinks are occasionally to be found on the landings. There's no adequate provision for the reception of waste and so on. So the houses were in such... Uh, an appalling, as they say, uh, condition that the compulsory purchase order process was probably very attractive to slum landlords and they may have contributed to the wanton vandalism of these houses. So Tiernan writes a memo um, to the city manager in 1943 talking about while the upper floors of these houses were all occupied, the ground floors were desecrated and empty. And this is another account of him finding flooring removed and stairs and basement, stairs to the basement removed, back walls removed and so on. So there's a material shortage on the one hand, but really it points to what we know. The fabric of the 18th and 19th century city was in rag order. So returning to the, the, the reconditioning program, here are the, the plans. So above would be the original, the Georgian, if you like, and especially these are the, the bigger houses. These are smaller houses here. And then this is the, the significant chopping up of those plans. And of course, the attractiveness of the Georgian floor plan is its simplicity. It's just this you know, infinitely adaptive and adaptable, flexible uh, building, as we know. Um, it's this one room to the front, one room to the back, um, with the fireplaces contained only in the party wall. So the corporation under Turnan 
chops things up. And really importantly, I think this LW on the plan is really important. It's this light well that does all the hard work and punctures the building from the basement up to the, up to the roof, to the sky. Um, the point, of course, being that um, the retention uh, using the light well, as we'll see, it means that all the services can be put into this um, really hard-working, um, basically, hole in the middle of the building, which cleans up um, the brick front, or it leaves the brick front free. So it's all about this kind of facadism. Um, if we see this, these are the marks, um, some of the, I don't know how original um, these are, but they're from City Council, uh, archives um, in relation to York Street in this instance. Um, and here's York Street, an aerial view. And what we can see is, of course, these timber frame, um, concrete and asbestos roof structures that are placed behind the facade. Um, so to let more daylight in, um, annexes at the back of these buildings were removed. Um, sometimes here we have Gardner Street uh, before and after. They're really keen on the before and after. Um, and we can see these boxed in um, gardens. We also see uh, the insertion of a fifth and sixth story owing to the generous floor to ceiling heights of the, of the, of the, of the Georgian original. Um, it's interesting uh, just to look at the roofscape. So this is um, York Street before demolition in 2002. This is a view of the very glamorous, pretty bleak uh, light well. And here is um, uh, the roofscape as published in 1946. So the scheme was published in the British Architects Journal. It was deemed uh, really successful. It was fairly cheap and it was really... Um, it was, it was really good in terms of reuse of, of well, really good, um, very questionable in terms of conservation, but in terms of reuse of materials. And of course, the increasingly popular asbestos is introduced sitting on this economical and light um, framework. Um, inside, naturally, the interiors bore little resemblance to their originals. Again, these are published in the Architects' Journal. Um, and what is remarkable is that everybody gets a built-in fitted kitchen, which in 1942, 43, 44, 45, 46 and on was really um, something that didn't happen, and also um, an interior bathroom. As we know, with the Sims blocks, um, they contained a, t a bath under the sink and a toilet set under the kitchen table and a toilet separately. To have a fitted um, indoor bathroom um, was, you know, re re was was really something else. Importantly, um, the the tenants weren't able to open the window of the light well in case they were used as rubbish. Um, dumps. Um, and, you know, there's there's a real sense from the discourse from local government and from the pamphlet that, you know, the, the tenants weren't really to be to be trusted given the extent of damage to buildings that they had come into. Um, and there's a fairly harrowing account, for instance, from Horace O'Rourke from the same period talking about a seven-year-old child has fallen down the stairs due to the removal of by trespassers of the balustrade. So things had to be indestructible from the official's perspective. Um, and as, as I mentioned, everything is kind of set around these light wells, freeing up the front and back room for bathroom and live or for bedroom and living room in terms of ventilation, natural light. And then those hard working service areas are clustered um, around the the, um, the light well, also, as I say, freeing up the facade. So um, this facadism, albeit it is facadism, I think it's still extremely important that it's the corporation's most visible mid-war housing activity and it replaces flats for a long time. Um, it was something of a redefinition and, if you like, a salvation of considerable 18th century streets. Um, in terms of, you know, it's this over-rationalisation that became very popular through the 19th 70s and 80s, I suppose, the alignment of the fenestration, repointing of brickwork, and then amazingly all this, you know, pretty crude um, removal of the ironwork. Um, doorways were uh, replaced with reconstituted stone architraves. Um, they're very proud of how uh, shutters were salvaged for cupboard doors. And in the complete absence of metal at this time, um, the railings were used, were repurposed as fire grates. You can see this kind of sand and cement um, balustrade out the front of the building. But I think it's interesting that um, uh, these Georgian buildings 
that they would be chopped up and given a new life of usefulness is probably not that unpredictable, but that they should be used and become useful for the slum masses is something that's probably not really Im imagined. How's my time? Keep going. Keep going? Okay. <laughs> Um, sorry, it's probably exhausting for you all. Um, just to just to uh, just to alert us here to say flats um, being built by 1943, 44. There's only 24 being built, and thereafter through the 40s into the 50s, they do, it doesn't pick up really until um, as we, many of us have, are keen on the on the butterfly roof um, blocks that were made under Dahi Hanley from 1958. Anyway, so returning to the title of our talk, Clearing Hovels and Building Homes, and staying with lesser known but realised housing projects, um, I wanted to look at, uh, I'm going to kind of fly through this, this bit. Um, here's Noel Moffat. He is the first Irish person to attend SIAM, which is the Congress of International Modern Architecture, in its first post-war meeting in England. He was working in the town planning office of Dublin Corporation. He was part of the surrealist white stag art movement, and he had an experimental architecture studio in Dublin, which was really pushing the use of plywood and bakelite in buildings. And um, so he, the title of this lecture is called, is after a talk that he gave. Um, he's trying to encourage an uh, the first high-rise housing block for Dublin in 1941 for the slum-ridden area of Charlemont Street near the canal and the barge pub there. Um, he was there, uh, he, he, when he's talking to the audience, it's a fundraiser, um, something a bit like this, but not trying to get money out of you guys, um, that he, he evokes this kind of wistful utopia of France and the high rises of France and the fresh air and such and so on. And he's plugging this scheme that the, his friend, the young Michael Scott, was designing for the Charlemont Public Utility Society. So this whole area, there, there was loads of tenement housing demolished so that Scott could build the new St. Ultans Hospital. He and Norman Good designed these two fairly unremarkable housing blocks in 1935, and then he's moving on to phase two, which is this section here, of which he only builds um, this bit, French Mullen House, today demolished in 2014. So um, he's Scott's done this. He gets um, uh, Moffat in to speak about what he's doing because the real money is what they want is to build this thing, which is a vast, three-armed, eight-storey block. Speaking of Vienna, it's kind of an evocation of the Karl Marx Hof. Not an evocation, it's actually going to make a Karl Marx Hof for Dublin, which would stretch from Charlemagne Street over to Richmond Street and partially enclose south-facing gardens and be something of, of, of a utopia. I'm briefly interested in French Mullen House because we, we were brought on site just after St. Ultimate's blocks were demolished in 2007 to make a case for its retention as the last block designed by Michael Scott, last piece of social housing in Dublin designed by Michael Scott. Um, but I think it's interesting today, as an, again, as, as an alternative to what the local authority were doing. Um, it's this tidy four-storey block containing 13 flats. He never got to build the eight-storey wonder. And um, this is it in floor plan. And I think what's important is that there are these two internalised um, uh, stairs, these walkways with these canopies. And of course, in doing that, what he's really trying to do, we have Scott here in French Mullen, and we have Sims, or the Sims block, which has this really important platform or deck access, which is the kind of defining trope of Dublin flat blocks, and that is markedly empty here. He's trying to get away from that. Um, he's really evoking the spirit of Walter Gropius, who's been to Dublin in 1936, and Scott brings him around the city. For those of you who don't know, Gropius is the former principal of the Bauhaus. Um, so this is uh, French Mullen House. Here's uh, one of the walk-ups. And uh, of course, you have these really modernist um, uh, vertical a span of windows, I suppose, for want of a better description. So these are the kind of schemes that that um, that Scott was evoking in his French Mullen, um, as I say, a kind of a fairly subtle alternative to Sims. But I'm flying through this because we all agreed in our chat beforehand that it was more interesting to talk about prefabrication. We stand by that. So I want to jump ahead to kind of 
the culture outside of these two particular situations. Um, in terms of architectural culture in the 1940s and 1950s, there were no competitions in Free State um, Ireland uh, housing competitions, I mean to say, except for two that I found. Um, sorry, this is a, a Sims block uh, house. That the I was kind of putting that in there because the architects, they didn't say that much about what was happening with the housing, except they didn't like the flat blocks. They thought they were too low rise in the 30s and 40s, that they were too traditional in build and construction. And they constantly said, how can we build more cheaply? Um, and through the early 40s, there's this call over and over again to cater for the very poor. Um, so there's an emergency housing committee formed in 1942, with the RIAI, that's the Institute of Architects, the Corporation, Housing Societies and the Building Trades. And they're calling on the Corporation to cater for the very poor by building temporary dwellings. Now, prefabrication at this time is pretty much synonymous with the ephemeral. And so it gets a really bad press. Now, I'm talking on the 15th of December on Sims, and I might talk about his attitude to prefabrication, but he was very defensive about it and was really against prefabrication. He was presented with the scheme from one member of this new committee, Mr. Webb, who had made these draft designs, an architect for a prototype three-roomed dwelling that would cost only £250, including development work, that's road, sewage, fencing. And Sims defensively responded, quote, we are doing all that is humanly and practically possible under present circumstances, unquote. So we're during the war. He explained that the corporation was had a scheme in hand for 500 small two and three roomed one story dwellings. But unlike Webb's design, his incorporated individual washing facilities. So in terms of back to this point that there were no um, architectural competitions, um, there didn't seem to be space for the architects to nudge their way in. So they're kind of elbowing their way in consistently and lobbying government through the century um, for competitions. I only found evidence of two competitions until the 1975 corporation competition that led to the wonderful city key housing down the way. And um, there's this very small 1944 competition for the Irish Country Women's Association for an Ideal Cottage. And then in 1953, there's this also an ideas competition for an ideal house, which was a temporary house built on the site of the mansion house on Dawson Street. And it was designed, or it was won by Fred Rogerson. Um, but there were small scale Irish experiments in prefabrication. The leading force was Moffat, who will come to. But there was also Frank Gibney, who in the end designed the Bordnamona villages um, the housing for the peat workers in the 1950s. He designed in the 40s a modern clay cottage using materials from the site. And he then developed that into a concrete um, structure based on segmental arch construction. There was also this really wonderful chap who I'm interested in at the moment, an avant-garde engineer, Major Waller. Um, and he invented two systems of lightweight concrete construction, the Nofrango system here from the late 20s that endured through the early 40s, and then the Catesophon system, which he ended up peddling and built all sorts of weird and wonderful structures across the continent of Africa, um, and also garages and pig sheds um, in, in Cork, of all places. Um, so he adapted this Nofrango, first of all, for working class housing. Um, it was a system of jute or hessian fabric onto which concrete was sprayed in stages. Um, I don't understand how it is used in houses later on. I can't recognise it at all. We only see it in this in this case in ads, in, in journals. Um, it's, it's very hard to find evidence of it. But there were two examples. Uh, there were two local authority housing schemes designed in Wexford and Carlow. Um, and he peddled it across the UK at the start of the war using, of course, as it does, cement and timber, or rather cement and aggregate over timber and steel. Instead of timber and steel, it was definitely um, a more popular solution or a potential solution if there had been money put into it because it was waterproof, flexible, cheap. And as the ad says here, it's reputedly 30% cheaper in construction 
than traditional methods. But by the end of the 1940s, we're just seeing it in lift shafts and water tanks and silos and other vernacular projects. So prefabrication was either so vernacular it was for pig sheds or it was so avant-garde it wasn't trustworthy. And increasingly through the, through the decade of the 40s and into the 50s, it's considered a necessary evil that has to be kind of considered, but really to be kept at bay. So Moffat is trying to, Noel Moffat is trying to bridge the gap between the vernacular and um, the avant-garde. Um, so back to Moffat, or, and we're going to kind of run through him and then finish on the Orlet scheme. Three minutes, five minutes? Okay. So this is something that Moffat um, is doing. Uh, this is the first thing he really gets to design um, in Sutton in North Dublin. And his real point of pride here, it's not so much prefabrication that this house, these houses cost £1,200 each, which was the same as a corporation house at, the, at this time. But of course, you've got this really interesting open ground floor plan. The roof is this shallow pitched roof, of asbestos, corrugated asbestos sheets. And he designs his first, um, I suppose I was looking at the EcoCube plans out here, and he's, he's peddling these through the 1930s and 1940s, these units or cells that can be added to. And when you have more children or you have to bring family members into your house or you get rid of people, you get rid of cells, you bring more cells in, potentially you build upstairs, etc. So eventually he gets to do this with three um, houses, which I've never seen. This one here was built in Dublin, here on the right-hand side. And this is, yeah, this one was built in Dublin, but moved to Bantry in West Cork, the Grayson House. Um, it's a three-bedroomed house. Um, we've got the Hegarty House, which is over here, location unknown, and then this really small um, one-roomed, um, the Weekend House. These were all... Um, published in a journal in the late 1940s. Um, so I suppose the thing to say, um, zooming through Moffat, when he's talking about um, prefabrication, uh, he's, he's talking, he talks a lot about the biggest stumbling block uh, to prefabrication in Dublin at this time are the Dublin bylaws, which don't allow kind of any new ideas on house building um, because they prescribe a minimal thickness of wall of nine inch and materials must be stone, brick or concrete. And if you want to uh, build something of less than nine inch thickness um, or cavity walling of less than nine inch thickness, a special order had to be gotten from the city manager or from the housing committee in order to build a prefab house. So that makes prefabrication pretty, you know, it's precluded effectively until we might say Ballymun. And I'm going to finish on this tiny short story about this really interesting scheme that kind of nobody really knew, just hidden in plain sight situation. We all believe there was no prefabrication in Ireland until Ballymun from 1965. Um, but following the, the discourse and following what Moffat was talking about and also change in government that Michelle mentions in 1948, which establishes the new Housing Consultative Council, sees the government looking at aluminium and timber prototypes and going on a study tour to Sweden, London and Glasgow. So following kind of the evidence, um, realise that uh, the, the government or local authority officials similar to the 1920s jaunt to Rotterdam and Amsterdam and Slough, which uh, then lead to, you know, in a way, our midwife to the flat block scheme, um, realised that actually uh, Dublin Corporation were looking at prefabricated methods in earnest and specifically brought this, uh, this type of house back called the Orlet or LIT. Um, so hidden in, in plain view was an estate, a small mini estate on the fringes of uh, Crumlin South, the Captain's Avenue, an estate of 58 houses that had been built with this prefabricated method. So this is Orlet, really briefly, um, published in a, in, a, in a book on, on housing for tomorrow, Tomorrow's Houses, 1945. Um, it entails uh, a raft, concrete raft foundation, so significant work at that level, on-site work, and then a, pre, uh, uh, a reinforced concrete pre-made frame comes on site, and then cladding is put onto that, and the cladding um, contains this uh, external cavity walling. 
Um, and where just to, yeah, after that, then you have uh, door and window surrounds and then party wall slabs. Following that, partition walls are built and then two fireplaces. And lastly, terrazzo sills are set. So as much ado about this Orlet housing, it's considered acceptable um, because it's very traditional looking. There's the English Orlet on the left and the Scottish Orlet on the right. Most of the English is flat roofed, so the Irish aren't having any of that. They say, we'll have the Scottish model, please. Um, so David Courtney Builders is appointed by Dublin Corporation to carry out this, this uh, scheme of 28 houses that have to be built in 28 weeks in 1948. Um, and it's this area called Captain's Avenue. Um, so here is Captain's Avenue. I took those photographs and the people looking out the window at me, what? I written it to run away. Um, so I haven't been back here. Construction began in November 1949 and the houses, all 58, were fully occupied by June 1950. And I'll finish on the litany of problems. They were slimmer and light, more lightweight, um, but there was no sense of them being factory made, as you can see from their silhouette and their general massing and disposition. They're very similar to what we're used to in, in Dublin. And I think that was the, why, why they were brought in. Um, but in the first post-occupation inspection in October 1950, there was a litany of material defects the wooden, the pine and deal treads of the stairs were split from end to end. Internal plaster had cracked, fireplaces come away from the wall. Smoke was issuing from the concrete surround on the wall. It's an amazing report to read, by the way. Window boards were not properly secured. Bathrooms, hand basin taps were loose. Gutters were not properly fitted and window sashes of steel appeared inadequate. The maintenance inspector noted that tenants had inserted paper between the frame and the sash, and he concluded, quote, as we were leaving, some eight or 10 tenants surrounded us and threatened rent strike if the defects were not put to hand at once. The principal complaint was rain percolation from the heads of the ground floor windows. So in the Orlet example, I think it's kind of a lesson to us all in taking what's happening in here in these designs seriously. It would seem that the gesture towards prefabrication at this time was made, but the experiment failed. So it was like, well, let's go back to the, the sameness of the 1930s model. And I'm kind of handing, getting ready here for, um, for Brian. In the Orlet example, prefabrication is not used as a research tool to get to the true nature of housing needs. It's really adopted as a kind of hard up version of traditional models and it maintains the monopoly and the reliance the dominance of the three-roomed dwelling which is paul how do we pronounce him freshner we don't know how to pronounce him he's written a book the dynamics of irish housing you probably know 1965 do you know how to pronounce his name it's P-F-R-E-T-Z-S-C-H-N-E-R, for -E Freshner, <laughs> pointed out in 1965, the three-bedroom dwelling may, makes up three quarters of Irish houses, despite the fact that the type only suited one third of the population. So over to Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Brilliant. Spot prize for anybody in the audience who gets the pronunciation and the spelling yeah. of Mr. Fretch, for Fretchner. Fretchner, yeah. Um, listen, that was wonderful because one of the things that's connecting back into our current debates on modern methods of construction, modularization and prefabrication, rapid build housing, uh, and how quickly we can reply to the demands of, of, the, of the housing needs that are presenting, but also that the make do requirements of different periods of economic history have led to great innovation and i've got to compliment you you got through all of the key favorites from bauhaus <coughs> gropier mentioning karl marx hoff in vienna as well uh, and getting into moffat and so forth it was really 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 interesting about building sciences and materials and what we're doing in the production of the space that we call home and very much thinking about the circular economy and what can come forward in terms of new methods of construction. But also with that very, very stark warning about testing the efficacy, the standards, and the, and the functional use of these buildings, and not allowing our, our proposed new housing to become some kind of experiment uh, 
that people who can otherwise not afford to live anywhere else will will be, will be kind of like tested upon. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot in that too. So thank you very much, and I'm sure there will be many, many more questions and observations as we go forward. So uh, without further ado, our last contributor uh, this evening is Dr. Brian Ward, who's a lecturer in the School of Architecture, Building and Environment at the Technological University of Dublin. Fantastic, TUD. Uh, previously called something else, of course, but the TUD is one of our more recent achievements in Dublin. We're all very proud of it up there in Grange Corbin. Um, he's qualified and uh, practicing, practicing architect from the Puer and Dominic Stevens architects in this period of time. Produced quite a number of interesting pieces of work, interested in locating design skills uh, and architecturally uh, informed design skills within their social and cultural contexts. Publications include Irish Housing Design 1950 to 1980, Out of the Ordinary, uh, which he co-edited uh, with Gary Boyd and Michael Pike. And he's recently curated a number of exhibitions, Sarah Sheridan and himself, and Marion Mahoney Griffin over the Irish Architecture Foundation. And most recently, co-curated uh, the Architecture of Creative Learning for the Irish Pavilion in Dubai. So a busy gentleman altogether. <laughs> uh, so very much welcome, Brian. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, just no, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> keep going forward. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so um, my talk tonight then is going to be based on that um, book, The Irish Housing Design, um, 1950 to 1980, uh, which looked at um, nine uh, case studies uh, built during that period. Um, we had some wonderful authors who each took a case study and wrote about them. Um, and then, uh, um, and actually the introduction to the book drew hugely <laughs> upon um, Michelle and Ellen's work, so it's really nice to be here uh, this evening um, with them. And then a couple of years later, myself and Gary kind of reflected on six of the um, case studies in a chapter that appeared in this book, and that um, chapter is going to form the basis of uh, tonight's uh, talk, and it picks up exactly where um, Ellen left off, so you can all see uh, the name that um, she was uh, trying to pronounce. And I won't uh, go there after her. I'm sure she got it absolutely right. Um, so this was a, a book published in 1965, an American political scientist coming over, as far as I understand, a political scientist trying to look at the Irish housing landscape um, and uh, draw some, or you know, write a report about it. Um, and um, myself and Gary were interested in kind of returning to that and then uh, using his report to think about um, our case studies relative to, I suppose, the, um, the, uh, the, the ordinary or the general kind of housing production um, of the period. And we were interested in this kind of assumption that he talks about um, of um, the Irish people having a conservative uh, temperament, and that out of that then becomes this kind of dull, monotonous and routine um, housing estate, and like Ellen, our housing landscape, and like Ellen, we were interested in um, this um, uh, problem, I suppose, that he identified um, of the replication, um, you know, at, on a monotonous scale of the three-bedroom house, um, and his um, observation that, um, you know, that, the, that that housing production was premised on one type of family being replicated kind of across the country. And he drew attention to the fact that obviously, you know, the, um, the, our, our population was more heterogeneous um, than that. You know, clearly this is uh, not the case. So we um, started to situate then the, um, the housing, the kind of case studies that we were looking at against um, some of the um, kind of sociological studies go, uh, that were done of Ireland um, at the time, um, in particular family and community in Ireland by Ar Arensberg and uh, Kimball, and then New Dubliners, urbanisation and the Irish family. So again, the notion of family is really important um, in both of those. But kind of inspired by um, the way in which Fredsner um, had identified that the, 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 the people for, or the population, the public for whom um, the, um, this housing was being built for, it was obviously you know, built for real people, but there was a kind of a fictive element um, to uh, the, the population that was being imagined um, for this housing production. We also then drew 
on um, you know, uh, people who were involved in writing a fictional account of what was going on in Ireland at the time. And we were interested in, the, in um, what we saw as being a kind of a confluence between some of the uh, fictional um, characters that were being um, created um, in, middle, in mid um, 20th century Ireland, and then um, also the kinds of um, uh, people for whom some of the building, some of the housing on the fringes of housing production was being uh, produced for. So some of the speculators that we were looking at, we thought were also kind of building for the, the country girls that Edna O'Brien um, was talking about. Um, 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 you know, at, at, at that time. And I suppose we were interested in the way in which um, the, the housing of that period was um, constructing um, the, um, the Irish uh, family and that the Irish family was something which was being constantly kind of reconstructed within the housing um, of, the, of the period, but that also there were people uh, resisting both that housing and also, I suppose, the family that was um, at the core, um, or, you know, was the core public uh, for uh, that, that um, housing. And we were also interested in um, drawing attention to uh, both architects and uh, kind of people within, um, the, uh, uh, within the Irish public who um, were resistant to um, you know, th this um, homogenous uh, kind of um, housing landscape that was being built uh, for them in the middle of the, um, of, of the 20th century. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, Fredsner himself uh, draws attention to uh, the fact that there are a few kind of uh, well-motivated individuals, he says, who are, um, you know, challenging, I suppose, uh, that homogenous uh, landscape. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, kind of like um, Ellen, uh, prior to me, I'm, I suppose what uh, this talk is doing is talking about um, some of the production that's happening around the edges of the, um, of the general housing production, where maybe some of the more interesting um, work it, um, happened at the time. Um, so, and I suppose the other thing to draw attention to is that this is a time, the period that I'm looking at, kind of 1950s to um, the beginning of the 1970s, it's a time of huge uh, demographic, demographic uh, flux, um, and we're interested in, um, or we were interested in, the, in that chapter in kind of charting how architects and also speculators, developers, and authors were thinking about that flux and the kind, and then how the uh, how, so how some of the housing um, uh, in the uh, housing production in the country uh, dealt with the uh, kind of characters that emerged out of that flux as we you know move um, into the Lamas period and um, Ireland is opened up. Uh, to uh, you know, to the markets, and then you know the the kind of between, I suppose, the structures of the church, the state, and the market. All of these uh, new kind of figures start to uh, start to emerge. So we divided it into um, three um, sections, and then we just picked two from each of those. So one um, is uh, the first section was uh, looking at uh, some of the. Um, housing produced within the rural landscape. Uh, then we uh, zoomed in on uh, the southeast of the city, um, so um, uh, called uh, you know Bagatonia, the kind of Bohemian district of the city, but also um, the area in Dublin in which most of the um, the offices were were being built at the time. Again, drawing upon uh, research done uh, by um, by by Ellen, um, but you know with the arrival of the the office block into um, into into Dublin City, there's a whole kind of range of new employment opportunities that open up, and that in, in turn starts to attract people uh, to that part of town. But also the kind of the bohemian um, atmosphere of that of that uh, part of town, you know, attracts people to it. And again, that's char um, Edna O'Brien herself is living in that um, area. But also when um, the Country Girls gets to be uh, filmed later, it's set generally within that kind of part of town as well. And then. Um, we finished up by looking at um, a, a, a places within Irish housing history where uh, the people who were going to um, uh, live in the houses took a role in the design um, of, the, uh, of the houses as well, so in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, so in, this, in, in that case, we're looking at real people kind of um, asserting agency um, over, um, um, over uh, their, uh, their housing. Um, but again, I, and I suppose we were interested in kind of contrasting what they built against, I suppose, the fictive kind of publics that were imagined um, in, um, uh, you know, the more general production, maybe. Okay, so starting with the rural landscape then, and looking at um, 
Frank Gibney, and there's a wonderful exhibition upstairs on the Bordenamona um, housing. Um, so we'll look at that quickly in terms of just um, the, I suppose, in, in, in a way in which the, um, so the, the Irish family was being constructed, the, the, the kind of the modern Irish family was being constructed in developments such as uh, the Bordenamona housing, um, and uh, uh, trying to draw attention, I suppose, to some of the radical ideas embedded within um, um, uh, estates such as uh, Quill Dove, and then looking at uh, Castle Park by Dennis Anderson, uh, built about uh, 20 years later, and where, I suppose, by uh, looking at these two projects together, we're, uh, in both cases, we're looking at the rural landscape uh, being um, imagined um, a, a, a kind of uh, in a post-agricultural way, I suppose, in that uh, the Board Mona housing is thinking about bringing industry um, into the Irish landscape, and Castle Park then um, a development of um, houses in uh, just outside Kinsale, designed for the tourist and for retirees, are thinking about the Irish landscape in terms of um, it being a, a site of leisure, a place of leisure. So again, I suppose what we were interested in is the way in which these new figures um, started to open up creative possibilities for architects that, allow, you know, imagining these new figures within the landscape allowed a new type of house then to start to emerge um, around them within uh, their design, um, you know, within the, create, uh, within the creative process of, of, of design. Um, so, uh, as, as you all know, like uh, Fergal McCabe, Carol Pollard have written very well about um, the, the layouts of, of these uh, Bordenamona um, uh, housing estates, the wonderful way in which they gathered kind of public space um, within and you know, defined um, uh, public space uh, between the terraces. Um, what we were more interested in was thinking about uh, the kinds of people for whom they were being designed. So. Um, the, uh, they were predated by uh, male-only workers hostels, um, uh, but and it, it, um, and I suppose that was at a, a time uh, when Bordenamona were um, uh, attracting a kind of a, a very mobile workforce into uh, the Midlands in order to work the bogs. Uh, but in order to make that um, uh, that workforce be um, more stable and to you know to, to uh, in order to um, uh, industrially. Um, harvest the, the peat from the um, from the bogs. Uh, they needed to start to provide um, housing that would also start to attract the partners and wives of these uh, workers at, in, in, into the Midlands. So the um, you know this this housing has to kind of um, uh, somehow communicate an idea of family that could um, attract people um, to uh, to um, you know to, in, into the Midlands of the. Um, of, of the um, of the country, and we and we were interested in the way in which then um, the 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 housing was described at the time, um, and in particular, okay, so it's drawing attention to the lovely village greens and attractive lawns, but also there's a, um, and again it's similar to what um, Ellen was talking about, you know, the the fitted kitchen uh, within the reconditioned uh, tenements, again, um, kind of front and center in the discourse around uh, the village schemes are you know, the modern conveniences uh, being uh, provided uh, within, within the houses. And we were interested in placing that within a wider discourse then about um, the way in which um, electrification and the provision of hot and cold running water um, was um, part of the kind of the, uh, the thinking behind that was uh, to retain Irish women within the um, Irish rural landscape to stop them migrating to the city or emigrating abroad. So there's this, you know, this is an ESB kind of um, advertisement in which uh, this woman, uh, you know, stays within the um, within uh, the cottage in in, um, in rural Ireland because of the arrival of. Um, what was he called? Johnny Hotfoot, the, um, this kind of plug-like <laughs> um, uh, figure. Um, and I suppose, so that's one way, you know, uh, so, you know, obviously during this period, the cot uh, cottages across Ireland are uh, being um, electrified and, and kind of uh, made um, more uh, convenient for uh, the, modern, uh, the, the, the modern woman. Uh, but there's a distinction maybe then to be made between um, that kind of um, system of electrification and what's happening then within the Bordenamona housing. In that, as um, Aaron's Bergen Kimball observed, um, within 
um, the Irish rural homestead, there was um, a, a, a space of, there were spaces of overlapping labour and care, so that your know, children would uh, be brought out to the fields by the uh, by the male farmer, but um, so there would be kind of childcare happening out uh, amongst the fields, and then also uh, within uh, the you know the uh, the precinct of the house, there would also be productive labour being done by the woman. So there was all of this kind of it was a much more uh, complex kind of. Um, a blurring of um, uh, uh, productive and reproductive uh, labour around in and around the uh, in and around the house. Whereas what we get in uh, Bordnemona is a very clear distinction between spaces of labour out on the bog and then spaces of care um, in um, in in and around the um, the. Uh, the, um, the 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 house. So these photographs that Virgil McCabe found in the Bordnemona um, archives, you know, show um, during the day um, that this is a space for uh, women who are caring for children and I suppose uh, you know preparing to care for uh, their uh, husbands once they come uh, home from um, work um, out uh, um, out on the bogs um, in in, um, in in the, in the evening. And it's worth saying that. Uh, the women in, uh, board, in the Bordnemona estates had very little security of tenure. If their uh, husband died or if their husband left them, they were um, evicted from those uh, spaces. So there was a kind of a, a real a precarity there. But at the same time, these, um, this kind of very mute garden city uh, background is um, contributing to, um, uh, to this really awkward but very useful uh, phrase of house Revisation that is happening uh, within, um, uh, you know, within these estates. Um, so taking uh, women from one kind of situation um, and, and uh, bringing them into uh, this kind of modern um, um, situation of 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 of, of being um, a of being a housewife. So at the same time, it's kind of raising the living standards um, uh, within rural Ireland. It's also bringing this kind of new modern rural housewife into um, the um, into uh, in, in, into this kind of situation. And again. Um, Edna O'Brien's tracking that as well in the you know the figure of Baba's um, uh, mother as well. This kind of these kind of isolated women uh, within um, rural Ireland. So in that case, we were interested in I suppose the way in which um, the uh, uh, some of the, this kind of housing um, you know by by people uh, who are kind of caring about the um, their their designs as Fretzner identified and um, you know they're they're contributing to the construction of the Irish uh, family uh, in, in some ways. Okay, in Castle Park then we were interested in uh, the, the kind of the creative possibilities that opened up uh, to an architect such as Dennis Anderson um, once um, he started to kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, think about housing within the Irish landscape that would be for um, this, you know, this figure of the tourist or this figure of the uh, re retiree. Um, so the figure of the you know, this is a period then where um, Ireland is being um, um, uh, promoted, you know, with um, uh, Paul Henry paintings of uh, Clochons, and at the same time then um, uh, Dennis Anderson is uh, building a modern interpretation of a clock on and a very, in a very forward looking way for the time, uh, you know, looking back, reinterpreting Irish vernacular architecture in a really um, exciting um, in, in a really exciting way. He's also drawing upon um, his um, own uh, experiences as a, as a tourist in um, Italian hilltop villages, and in particular his observations of um, the kind of the blurring of the private and the public realm, the collapsing of, uh, um, of or, you know, uh, bringing those two realms into very close uh, proximity um, to each other. So he's drawing upon those experiences, producing uh, spaces like this within Castle Park in which um, you know, there's uh, very uh, small um, kind of public spaces uh, um, and uh, people are living you know, cheek by jowl within a rural, um, a rural situation. Um, and then out of that, um, you know, he finds a way of kind of um, arguing against the subdivi subdivision of space that you normally get within the Irish um, housing estate. And he's very vocal about that at the time as well. Um, that you know, if, if we're, um, if we're fr um, allowed to break free of the, the kind of regulations that prevailed at the time, um, and he was allowed to do so by Cork, uh, by the 
uh, planner in, in Kinsale at the time, you could make these kind of shared public spaces um, in which you know, people could walk right up to their neighbours' um, uh, uh, windows should they wish. Um, but you, know, you get this um, kind of blurring of space. That is, it to some uh, blurring of the public and the private, that is to some extent um, facilitated by the fact that these are being built for, uh, for, for tourists. So there's this new figure in the Irish landscape um, allowing this kind of, um, uh, this new fictive fi figure of sorts. Obviously, there's real tourists as well, but um, there's, you know, th this archetypal figure of the tourists allows then this new kind of uh, space to be made. Okay, so then uh, jumping to um, the southeast of the city, uh, to Bagatonia. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of new house, um, uh, office blocks being built and therefore housing for uh, the new um, office workers. Um, so we're going to look at uh, Simmons Court Apartments by Brian Hogan first, um, and then um, we look at the, um, the uh, Mespel um, Apartments. Uh, so these are um, very large, uh, four, so this is uh, the, uh, the Simmons Court apartments are four apartments, uh, you know, extremely large, built with um, the idea of um, entertaining, um, but also built in order to um, to uh, uh, to attract um, uh, or you know uh, for uh, people who are moving out of uh, large houses in Ratgarb. Uh, Ballsbridge, uh, Donnybrook and Terenure, partly because the houses have become uh, too large to uh, be properly staffed. Um, that uh, because of the arrival of office jobs and factory jobs in, in Dublin, uh, the uh, country girls that would normally be coming up to uh, work um, in the service of these families are instead uh, you know, uh, finding themselves uh, much more glamorous jobs in these uh, new office uh, blocks also being built um, by uh, Brian Hogan um, at the time. And there's a kind of a blurring of... Um, he's, he's taking some of his learnings from the building of the office blocks into uh, the building of um, his housing um, at, at, at the time. So there's a made problem um, that, th that the Simmons Court apartments are... Um, uh, addressing uh, by uh, laying out, uh, as uh, Brian Hogan describes, um, the, um, he, he was uh, taking kind of uh, ratios that he used to design the office blocks in terms of served and service and using them to think about um, these, um, uh, these apartments. So what was of concern to him was to maximize uh, this space here, which is the kind of entertaining space within the house, which is 75 uh, square meters, so a hall, a dining, and a, and a, and a living room. Um, what we were interested in was um, this um, bedroom here, so it's a three-bedroom house. Uh, but um, given that at the time, um, you know, one of the ways in which um, uh, buildings were being thought of um, after Louis Kahn's notion of served and servant spaces. Um, uh, one of the things that is animating this design is um, making this clear distinction between um, the, what is uh, served and what is a uh, servant. Um, so, you know, the chimney is um, isolated from the main block of the house, but so also is this um, bedroom here with the deep reveal, and the window of this bedroom here is um, the same as the windows of these two service spaces here, the, uh, the two bathrooms, which are next to these two, um, these two bedrooms. So this is presumably then um, a, um, a space for a servant. So you know, one of those country girls trying to um, escape the, uh, uh, the, the drudgery of being a housewife, perhaps in rural Ireland, um, but not being able to afford maybe to, uh, or, or not lucky enough to find work within um, the, um, uh, within, uh, the office. Um, the offices of South East Dublin is ending up um, within, uh, that, uh, within that room serving one of the kind of, uh, one of the managerial class, as Humphreys um, uh, spoke about them. OK, but then if you're lucky, maybe and you do get work in one of those offices, uh, you might get to then live in the Mespel um, apartments. Um, and again, you know, this is, uh, again, in Humphreys, uh, just talking about uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the search for um, occupational careers to avoid uh, the drag of being, um, of being married amongst um, uh, Irish women at the time. Um, and the Mespel estate then, um, again, featuring in the, um, the uh, promotional material, 
the kitchen and the modern conveniences in the kitchen is uh, presented front and center. But in this case, it's, you know, uh, the modern conveniences aren't there in order to uh, create more time for you uh, to care for others in your family. Instead, um, the, uh, they're there in order to produce leisure time for you that you might spend within the city. It's very important, the location of the Mespel estate within uh, the city, that's part of the promotion. But also then, um, in, uh, that you might get to spend time within the gardens around um, the, uh, the blocks of flats within, or blocks of apartments within the Mespel estate. So, you know, in the tennis courts, for instance, that are provided for at uh, the residence. So it's this, again, this notion of leisure time, um, this kind of new kind of person coming to the city, enjoying uh, what the city has to um, offer. And then out of that, I suppose, um, reducing perhaps the amount of room that has to be provided uh, for this person. Um, so um, um, you know, these people being um, singletons or being uh, within um, just a couple but with no children um, are living in uh, bedrooms, or sorry, bed sitting rooms or one bedroom flats um, uh, being provided within uh, the blocks within the Mespel estate. And I suppose the most radical of them all in that, on those terms then is uh, Cherry House, although it's kind of hidden behind a neo-Georgian uh, facade. Um, in terms of the kind of um, the uh, the accommodation it's providing, it, it's it's very radical within again um, a country in which you know it, it, we're talking about the reproduction of the uh, three-bedroom um, you know semi-D being the normal um, uh, building being uh, being provided. It's worth staying, actually. Sorry, I should have drawn attention to that. Like. Um, uh, like all of these, uh, all of this housing is to some extent state-sponsored. So the Mespel and the Simmons Court were both built by um, Irish Life. Um, so you know, underpinned by uh, by the government. And then we're looking at uh, you know the Bordnamona estate being uh, built by uh, uh, um, uh, you know semi-state corporation, and to some extent then Castle Park uh, you know uh, being allowed. Uh, to break some of the uh, the planning rules at, at at the time, so there's a kind of state sanction, I suppose, uh, under uh, allowing this kind of uh, um, exploration of housing for people who uh, may not kind of fit within the the normal model of the um, Irish uh, Irish family. And in this case, we're going to look at two schemes then, which again, um, although. Um, um, in one case, it's it's um, it's a group kind of arguing against the state provision of of, of housing. In both cases, the the state or the uh, the local authority is facilitating uh, these people finding uh, finding uh, finding housing. Um, so um, the first one we'll look at is uh, the Bally uh, Brack Cooperative Housing out in Bally Brack um, in South Dublin, um, and then the Coombe North in the um, in uh, the inner city. Uh, the first by Noel Dowley and the second by Delaney McVeigh uh, Pike. Uh, the Ballybrack uh, Cooperative Housing was built for um, a, a group of people, um, young couples uh, living in um, the uh, flats of you know, the Victorian houses in Dunleary, around that area, um, who gathered themselves into a cooperative um, and uh, hired uh, Noel Dowley in order to build um, houses uh, for them, uh, they I, saw themselves as kind of uh, being a kind of part of a kind of a transitional generation, and um, that they that their parents might have been able to build their houses for themselves. They had lost those kind of practical skills, but what they had gained, um, and these are you know people you know lower middle class people, what they had gained was the confidence um, to, as they saw, to you know to hire an architect. Um, to go and you know to uh, get mortgages etc from the uh, bank manager. So they um, certainly the, their secretary Bernard Thompson, um, who I interviewed um, while writing about uh, the Ballybrack housing, saw themselves as as part of this kind of transitional uh, generation. He also though observed that um, although uh, there was a kind of a participative design process um, created between uh, the cooperative and uh, Noel. Uh, Dowley, um, that, um, and although uh, wives and partners came uh, to those sessions, that uh, the women were kind of on the fringes of the design of the of any decision-making process that was uh, that was going on. So again, um, I suppose just drawing on uh, June Levine's uh, kind of observation then that there were different speeds of change happening within Ireland um, at this um, at at this time. 
Um, so um, the local authority provided housing uh, for the cooperative, uh, Dunleary Ratdown, um, but they also dictated um, that, um, it, that uh, it had to be a series of uh, semi-Ds that would be built. So again, I suppose, just that, uh, the monotony of that landscape that Fretzner um, uh, uh, observed, some of that comes from uh, a, a kind of a conservative mindset, I suppose, within the local authority. Uh, Noel Dowley and the cooperative were both interested in exploring ideas of terraces, etc. Uh, but there was an insistence that uh, semi-Ds be provided. Within that, though, uh, both uh, the architect and the, his clients wanted to take uh, full advantage of the um, the, the, the volume of their house. Uh, the house was dictated by um, standards that were that came from uh, you know their grant application. There was a certain size of house, um, but within that they wanted to take full advantage of the full volume, so not to have an attic, etc. Um, so they came up with this really interesting uh, section, um, you know, um, uh, split level uh, section, and they were particularly adventurous in their use of. Uh, materials uh, uh, in order to reduce the cost they were willing to uh, you know to experiment um, with uh, materials and again I suppose that gives uh, that is a corrective maybe to uh, Fretzner's observation of this kind of conservative uh, mindset they were um, extremely uh, you know adventurous in the kind of materials they were specifying in time, I suppose what that happened, what that meant was that a lot of those materials, again, uh, 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 kind of building upon what Ellen was saying, a lot of those materials didn't last particularly long. But they did get, you know, get the houses built. They got the families into these houses. But then over time, a lot of the materials were um, uh, had to be replaced over time. So the uh, the estate. Or, uh, the the you know, three rows of houses has kind of blended back into, I suppose, the the kind of more general um, uh, uh, suburban landscape that we're all familiar with in in Dublin. But still, kind of embedded within them is this split level um, kind of organisation, a flow of space that you don't usually get uh, within uh, the suburban uh, landscape. Uh, within uh, the Coombe North, then um, designed by Delaney McVeigh and Pike. Uh, in uh, late 60s and right through the uh, 70s, we get a, um, a local community um, that, uh, because of a road widening scheme um, and a slum clearance scheme, um, are um, you know being told that they're um, that the, the kind of the terrain that they uh, that they know that they uh, that they live in um, is going to be um, eradicated, but they're also going to get a new uh, new, uh, new housing out of out of all of this. Uh, they uh, gather together and start to object to the road widening scheme. Uh, they uh, join forces with um, UCD architects and students in in the School of Architecture, but also with the Dean of St Patrick's. So they become a very kind of influential uh, community advocacy uh, group, and they also then hire um, Delaney, uh, McVeigh, and Pike. Um, and they, at this stage, then there's been, um, you know, like uh, uh, so many people have been moved out to the suburbs from the inner city, um, that people are aware of, you know, the kind of life that um, is being provided in uh, Crumlin, Cabra, Marino, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they're able to identify that what they have within the inner city is something particular and distinct, I suppose, from the kind of life that is facilitated in those kinds of suburbs. So they're arguing um, against, you know, uh, being um, uh, being moved back out to what they call uh, Bali far out, um, which is a lovely a lovely term. But they're also arguing then against the um, the um, the you know the, the urban structure that uh, uh, it was was being built by uh, the uh, by the city council or the corporation in the uh, Dahi Hanley blocks that um, uh, Ellen was talking about uh, previously. Um, so what they get then designing with uh, Delaney McVeigh Pike is a, a scheme uh, which um, you know creates coherent um, a, a creates a coherent urban block and within that block then. Uh, provide the shared uh, courtyard uh, for them. And I suppose that's a running theme 
within all of these schemes, you know, that very often it's, there's kind of more shared space um, that is, is uh, provided. Um, and to some extent, and that's important, I suppose, given that some of these are very small uh, houses, particularly in the Mespel estate, but the payoff is that you get then um, shared, um, you know, good uh, shared space external to um, your um, to your dwelling unit. And most importantly, I suppose, given that uh, their interest is in retaining, retaining the sociality of, of the street, they each get a door onto the street and then a section that kind of uh, comes up uh, from, uh, f from that. Okay, so then just to conclude, I was going to uh, read very, uh, a short piece. Um, so, and I suppose just to acknowledge that uh, Gary would be involved in, in the writing of this as well. Okay, so mid-20th century Ireland was more heterogeneous and more fluid than was evident in the housing stock being produced here in the middle of the 20th century. As the ideas underpinning Fretzner's homogenous landscape began to fragment and develop under Ireland's economic liberal liberalisation after the 1950s, accepted conventions concerning the built environment also changed, allowing more heterogeneous concepts of living to infiltrate design and space. New definitions of Irishness were created and consumed, and ideas of domesticity were taken apart and put back together again around new Irish subjects. The architects of these schemes discussed tonight took advantage of the creative possibilities presented to them within these shifting demographics and the different forms of sociality they offered. But while these projects may have, may have proposed alternatives to and within Ireland's residential landscape, they were also inevitably shaped by the same unique but rapidly changing set of social, economic, historic, and religious conditions that constituted the Irish state in the middle decades of the 20th century. The apparent opening up of new possibilities of social freedoms were often simultaneously bound by new constraints or persisting ones such as gender inequalities. Built during an era of demographic flux, some of the projects detailed here speculated on new publics emerging in particular contexts, while others facilitated new publics forming around the architectural design process. Housing was created for real communities, but also for half-formed and sometimes conflicted fictive characters. Among others, the rural house housewife, the tourist, the country girl, and the new Dubliner. It was also created for those who resisted such roles or parts of them. Thank you. Right, thank you. Brian, thank you very much. Like, uh, again, another fascinating set of insights of just how gendered and how uh, transformative this uh, space that we're in has become and in, in its history as well, particularly around the liberties. Fascinated by, uh, by that. Um, we are very, very tight on time. Uh, I we didn't want to interrupt the flow, as you may have noticed. There's been a lot of flow, and there's been a lot of information back and forth. It is being recorded, uh, as you know, so you can watch it back at your leisure. Um, I'm going to be bold and say that in the next five minutes, we might have one or two quick questions, okay. and we'll try and wrap it up. So, uh, can I ask our contributors to come up to the front? I, I've only got you, one <laughs> minute because I've to... literally got one minute. Yeah. So I need a question first. I'm, I'm of due all. somewhere else at half eight. <laughs> Sorry. Somewhere else at half eight. Ellen. Uh, now Ellen. But no one has a question a lot of for things, me. Right. A lot of things. But I want a question to Ellen that really focuses on what do we need to learn most about that third sector approach that we talked about. What do we get from then that we bring into now? And uh, does anybody have anything specific on that thematic? First hand up gets to ask the question, by the way. There you go, the gentleman at the front. Hi. By reference to that. Um, fascinated by your reference to that system of sprayed hessian, mm. because there are some houses just close to me that I think are the ones you referred to, Loretta Terrace, yes. which is slotted into a conventional housing estate. Mm -hmm. And on the corners are uh, treated with half, t you know, fake half timbering. Mm -hmm. And then there are these extraordinary houses, um, flat mm -hmm. roofed and so on. So you know those, do you? I do, yeah. yeah. So I'm only starting that research. So if you want to do it with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you're great at researching, but there's... Yeah, there, they're very well looked after. Right. I wondered how successful yeah. this 
technique was? I don't know um, is the answer. So Waller is fascinating. So if you want to meet me in the archive soon, when term ends, we might look at his yeah, albums. Loads, <laughs> I'm sure you do. But the, you've always loads going on too. But the, um, the, the, I know the Katesophon, which is that really interesting. Is it Iranian, Mark? Is that, that name of that Katesophon? Some of Andalusian arch... Is it Iranian? Yeah. So, um, so it, he develops that further there, and that's I, I. We can go through how that works, but he ends up building big churches with this big span. But I don't understand how the Nufrango translates into a house, actually. So I, I'd love somebody, to learn more about it. Somebody so, locally mentioned this. You know, those I houses. Didn't really believe them. Yeah, and yeah. so so Waller is is an engineer. He he built a bridge down in UCC as well. Um, and, and then he built all these, like, um, I suppose they were early garages in Mallow and big places up in Cavan. And, but then huge, amazing spaces for congregation all over uh, the continent of Africa. All the names are colonial names. It's kind of, it's, it's an amazing history, actually, um, how he managed to peddle it, um, sell it far and wide. Of course, all of those systems are, are patented eventually. Um, and so he, he never got anywhere with No Frango, really, it would seem. Ruth McManus has done a bit of, yes. on, on no, no Frango. She, she, like me, was looking, found the ads over and over again in the journals, and I go, what is this? But there hasn't been very much site investigation by me or her or others. So you've probably done the most, <laughs> by even noticing. It's even <laughs> noticing it. It's the first part of the inquiry. Thank you very much. Is there a question, then, for uh, Professor uh, Norris? Anybody have a question for Michelle? Uh, nobody has a question. There's a gentleman there. I have to go, sorry. sorry. Um, the, the question, I suppose, is, is just to briefly describe where you see the, the AHB sector plugging in to the end of your story. Sorry. Where you, um, you were describing the, you know, the, the different financial models, the possible circling back onto older ones. Um, I'm just wondering. You know, do you see the, do you see what they're how they're I have to funding run. themselves as as a, okay. a kind of re so remodeling a re reuse you know. of that original type of uh, loan model. based funding model? Yeah. Yeah. The the I I spoke about council housing specifically, but the AHBs do use loan finance, so they're all funded by loans, generally state loans from the housing finance agency. Um, and uh, unlike local authorities, they also, but they also charge differential rents, but they get a subsidy reflective of cost to repay the loan and man manage and maintain the dwelling. So they, it's back to loan finance, which does kind of spread the costs over a longer period, and they get a better subsidy, a better amount of money for management and maintenance. The big problem with the council model, it's very affordable for people, which is a huge benefit differential rents. I don't want to be discounting that. But the big problem is it doesn't provide enough money to do upgrading repairs. It, it barely covers the cost of response maintenance. So the AHB funding model is more sustainable. They're also building a lot of cost rental. So we could have a situation where that model just seeps back across the sector. Um, obviously, if people can't afford their rents, they need a subsidy, by the way. But it, it, the issue is you know, you get an assured amount of money that allows you to repay the loan and particularly plan for management and maintenance, which we councils don't have currently. It's a complex question, but I think one of the things that's common about the more successful, more affordable, more sustainable housing systems in Europe is they have a very integrated housing subsidy system whereby, you know, the private or public landlord is integrated into a unitary rental model and that's a, a difference, a big difference here. So local authorities can't get an income subsidy for their tenants directly. And that's a, a challenge. Uh, we could raise rents if we could get an income subsidy directly. If we had higher rents, we'd have a higher revenue. We could issue a bond. We could go further with that and, and raise funny that, m money that way. Um, but look, that's a completely point, big point of departure for today. But it's a very substantive issue about how we finance our housing. It goes yeah. to the core of it. Exactly, yeah. Now, uh, final question then for the evening. Who's, f who's first and last? And this is for, for Brian, really. Does, that, does anybody want to take his critique of Edna O'Brien further? 
<laughs> or indeed just reflect on. What struck me was, you know, in, in the gendering mm. uh, of our housing designs and presumptions about who uses what space and so forth. Um, and in many ways, a lot of our housing systems have traditionally been and remain quite patriarchal and hierarchical in their determination of who gets to live here and what we allow you to do. As an aside, my favorite example would be Ormond Square. Take a little walk around Ormond Square. There's a plaque there to a certain footballer, okay? And it talks about how heroes are built there. And right beside it, there's a sign from my employer which says, no ball games here. <laughs> <laughs> so we are full of contradictions that way. Uh, but is there anything for Brian specifically before we conclude? Thank you. Um, just, it's more of a thought, I suppose, just about uh, the idea of corporation housing. Um, like we have, my, my granny always referred to it as corporation housing, and it just, on that word, it got me kind of thinking about uh, corporation tax and, you know, systems about how we finance uh, housing, social housing. So um, just in terms of the corporation tax in Ireland, uh, would it be possible to sort of leverage that towards multinational corporations and say, hey, look, if you start to uh, maybe get involved in the financial side of backing social housing, could you then have like some sort of grants or credits that you could allocate to those multinationals um, in some form of way? I don't know. Just a thought. That's a good suggestion, which does exist in France. Yes, French yes. have 1% employer tax on wages. And the employ it, it goes to fund the interest rate subsidies. Remember, I mentioned interest rate subsidies, very important. And in employers then get to nominate a certain amount of people directly into the social housing. So it, it, those kinds of things do exist everywhere in other places. The problem we have in Ireland is that the government pays for it all, which is great, and the government should pay for a lot of it until there are other priorities or no money. So the issue is to try to come up with a more stable funding model. Michelle and I are fans of the recently concluded Commission on Taxation. So it's not quite the world's first cure for insomnia, but there's a lot in there that's very, very important about widening that tax base. Yeah. And the challenges of how we've used housing as a form of wealth and as a form of transmitting, property rights as a form of transmitting wealth, and how that maintains a certain uh, continued segregation, stratification in our society. Well, it's very apparent today what, is, what it has brought to us. Uh, and we're going to continue to have to uh, work on resolving that. And I think, you know, one of the things that ties it all together is, you know, how we're paying for it and what we're getting for it and how we're using it at the same time. Um, there's a lot of other things that come out of this, of course, so perhaps we're going to have to have another session. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that note, um, thank you all very much for attending. And also thank you very much, Dahi, Danny, for chairing. And thank you to Michelle Norris and Brian Ward and also Ellen Rowley, who just had to go. Thank you very much for sharing all your experience and extensive knowledge with us. That's, because, that's why the talk went on longer, because there's so much here, so much information. So please come back next week um, for Talking Housing Now, and then the following week, Talking Housing Futures, in a part in this series, A Timeless Challenge. Um, also, thank you to the Housing Agency, um, and on behalf of the entire Architecture Foundation team as well, thank you for coming. And thank you to the Housing Unlocked team as well.